and you're on, Chris. Good evening, and welcome to the Libertarian Party of Kentucky's uh, second presidential debate. Uh, this evening, we have uh, some great candidates. We've got some great questions. Uh, I'm going to go over the rules very, very briefly so our viewers can look at uh, what those rules are, and then we'll go ahead and we'll, um, start with our first uh, debate question for the candidates. Um, each candidate will have um, uh, an introductory question from me and two minutes to answer. Um, each candidate will have a series of questions, two minutes to answer. Um, they'll have some questions that they can pose to each other, and they'll have a, a closing uh, remarks. Uh, each candidate also has three one-minute extension or rebuttal cards to use, uh, and we will be polling this debate at the uh, almost at the end and for one half hour after the closure of the debate. Please vote. Uh, the votes will determine who is invited to subsequent debates. Our um, possible final debate will be next Saturday, May 9th. We've got a couple other debates coming up, uh, general candidate forum for a bunch of candidates tomorrow night, and Wednesday night we have another debate. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn to our uh, panel tonight. Uh, we've got um, Judge Jim Gray, um, Joe Jorgensen, Vermin Supreme, and Jacob Hornberger on, um, and we may be joined a little bit later by John Mons. He was invited. Uh, he may be having some technical difficulties. So that's our lineup tonight. We look forward to having a, a good debate uh, with uh, with our panel. And uh, with that, I'd like to begin uh, with the introductory question to each of the candidates. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running. And uh, this is really an opportunity for you to give the delegates watching your biography. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Judge Gray tonight. Judge Gray? Well, and thank you. Thank you, indeed. Uh, it's nice to be back with Kentuckians. Candidly, uh, whenever I see the word KY, it, I think uh, personally that I adopted a son from Vietnam when I was in the Navy. So uh, his name is Kai. So I, I see that with, with love and affection. But I'm, one thing I really bring to this election, which is my background, uh, I'll be the first president of the United States that was in the Peace Corps. I was in the Navy. I was Navy JAG, but before that, I was actually awarded a combat action ribbon in Vietnam. I was a federal prosecutor for, for three and a half years in Los Angeles, ended up heading a unit prosecuting frauds against the VHA and FHA, of which there were many. And then I was a trial court judge for 25 years here in Orange County, and also actually uh, did something quite unusual for a sitting trial court judge back in 1992 while I held a press conference. And I assure you, judges don't do that, but uh, I stated to anyone that would listen that our nation's drug policy simply had failed of drug prohibition and we had to change it. I, my message is very directly now that libertarians are the only mainstream party in the United States of America today from my standpoint. Uh, we believe in responsibility at all levels of society, certainly including governmental, which is so lacking. Uh, we don't go for this polarization stuff. We believe in competition. We believe in a free flow of ideas. And we believe in, in uh, the best person winning on merits. So that is really an important thing. And I brought that message. For three years, I wrote a blog called Two Paragraphs for Liberty. And I turned that then recently into a book called Two Paragraphs for Liberty, but always underscoring the word libertarian. So two paragraphs for liberty, which solutions that are practical, effective, responsible, libertarian. I have actually had a podcast for the last, uh, uh, since April, and that is called All Rise, the Libertarian Way with Judge Jim Gray. So I tried to change our brand to make it mainstream because it is. By the way, uh, yesterday, because it's on every Friday, uh, yesterday, Joe Jorgensen was one of my uh, was being interviewed, one of my guests, and it was her birthday. So yes, <laughs> so Joe, belated happy birthday for May Day. But I've interviewed others, uh, Jacob Hornberger, all doing really well. Uh, Nick Sarwar, uh, Ben Fishman has been on it. Uh, Larry Sharp has been on it. Ken Armstrong as well. So all of these, I'm trying to promote libertarians. I'm proud of who we are, and in fact, this coronavirus recently has shown clearly the difference between a libertarian approach and the government politician approach, as we'll, I'm sure, talk about as we go. But people are in need, are desirous of what we would bring. I'm proud to say that we will bring this. And Gray Sharp 2020, support us. Don't support us. One way or the other, we will do you proud. Thank you, Judge Gray. Um, all right. Uh, uh, Joe Jorgensen, you're up. 
Hi, my name is Joe Jorgensen. I'm a longtime Libertarian Party activist, and I was Harry Brown's running mate in 1996. I was on the ballot in all 50 states, and I'd like to do that again. I'd like to point out that the media believe that third party candidates cost Hillary the election, and they're not going to let that happen to Biden. They are going to frame this election as a binary choice, Biden versus Trump. No other choice will be heard. We have to bypass this media blockade and create a direct channel to the voters. And there are prospects out there. In addition, in addition to libertarians who are already registered, there are about 40 million Americans who hold generally libertarian views. They just don't realize it. We have to reach them. Now, we're not going to reach them by only appealing to the purest of the pure libertarians, nor by targeting the market. Uh, the, the moderate. And we can't pin our hopes on attracting either the Bernie bros from the left or the never Trumpers from the right. Instead, our nominee must be deeply principled with a long-term commitment to our party, be able to communicate libertarian ideas in a way that non-libertarians will understand, because that's the way to grow the party. And we have to be able to show the benefits of bold libertarian principles. The last three libertarian presidential campaign staff did not share their data with the Libertarian Party, even though they had written agreements. Now, I'd like to make a note. I am not criticizing Gary Johnson or Bob Barr. I'm complaining about the Republican campaign teams who worked for them. As a candidate, as the nominee, I will share my data real time, just as I did when I was part of the Harry Brown team. We've already given our agreement in writing to the LNC. We need a bold candidate. I am that candidate, and my strategy will grow all levels of our party and benefit all candidates. And next, uh, we will have Mr. Supreme. Mr. Supreme? Hello. My name is Vermin Supreme, and I am an internationally recognized, highly respected political satirist, activist, and performer. I am a meme, and I am seeking the Libertarian Party nomination. For over 30 years, I've been using humor and satire as a successful anti-authoritarian communication strategy to mock and delegitimize the duopoly. This has allowed me to reach an audience of tens of millions of people around the globe, across the political spectrum, and earn free media across the flat earth. This project of mine has given me a level of notoriety and reach that allows me to make this legitimate offer of my services as a candidate to the Libertarian Party. Now, can the LP put up a wacky entertainer and not be accused of being a joke party? I say yes, it is all in the framing. We are a serious party with serious ideals and a platform for America. However, and to be quite honest, the duopoly presidential electoral system has risen to the level of a joke and with love and spite, and spike, here's Vermin Supreme, hashtag in on the joke. It is all about owning the joke and that will inoculate us against any sort of damage the lp is being given a choice of two very different time streams will it consist of the most amazing outrageous over-the-top educational informational entertaining dare i say legendary campaign that this country has ever seen or will it be something perhaps a little more staid delegates the choice of yours can we use humor as a weapon against the duopoly i say yes can we use humor as a tool of outreach, of education and recruitment? Yes, I say. And can we use humor as a tool to spread the word of liberty? I say emphatically, yes. Please check out my website, vermintsupreme2020.com. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Hornberg. Yeah, I grew up on a farm on the Rio Grande in the South Texas, near Laredo, Texas. I graduated from Virginia Military Institute with a degree in economics, infantry officer in the reserves for eight years, and a law degree at the University of Texas. When I was 28 years old, I was a trial attorney in my hometown, and I discovered the libertarian philosophy. It changed the course of my life. Libertarianism is the greatest political and economic philosophy in the history of mankind. It, it places the individual and his liberty as sovereign in society. And it gives us good things like prosperity and peace and health and harmony. This race for this presidential nomination involves more than just a political race. This is a battle for the heart and soul of this party and this movement. On the one side, you've got the reformers. 
those that are committed to reforming the welfare warfare state way of life in which we live. They've given up all hope of achieving a free society. They've accepted the foundation of this welfare warfare state. Their reforms include health savings accounts, school vouchers, immigration reform, embracing the income tax, the IRS, privatization of social security, reform, reform, reform. And then there's those of us that are battling for liberty. I have never given up hope for a, a free society. And in fact, until the day I die, I will believe that there's a chance to achieve a free society. And I believe that it is the destiny of this party to lead this country and indirectly the world to a free society. How do we do that? We are the party of principle. We've had 16 years of these reform oriented Republican like campaigns. I say, let's do something bold this time around. Let's run a campaign of pure principle for the party of principle. Let's use our assets, ideals, principles, and philosophy to take the battle to these Democrats and Republicans. Um, our next question, um, and thank you, sir, for that. Let me make sure that I reset my timer here before it goes off. Um, this is the each candidate. Do you believe that it is more important to be on message and platform or to earn votes and, and obtain media exposure to spread that message? Which is more important? Uh, we will begin this uh, question with uh, Joe Jorgensen. Joe? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me set my timer. I believe it is much more important to be on message because what we need to do in order to spread the message of liberty and freedom is we have to grow the movement. We have to bring in like-minded people. If we go out there and sound like Republicans, then people are going to start wondering, well, why don't I just vote for the Republican? The Republican has a better chance of winning. So we need to explain the benefits of liberty to people out there. We need to show mothers how they can have better education for their children. We need to show fathers how their children have better, better health care. We need to explain to families how they can go out and have a vacation every few years. And if they had no more income tax, what could they do with the extra $12,000 a year? How would they spend it? We need to explain that liberty isn't just an end in itself, but it can give them the life that they are looking for and a much better solution than the Democrats and Republicans. What the Democrats and Republicans are doing is are saddling us with additional debt year after year after year. We have to show how we can reduce the scope of government and give them the life they want. And we're not going to do that by softening our message. We need to go after and grow the party so we have more candidates, state, local, federal level, more people knocking on doors, more people donating money, more people supporting teams, and just plain growing the movement. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Mr. Supreme. I believe the, the two are absolutely connected and they have uh, been an integral part of my campaign uh, since the very beginning. Uh, when I entered this race, I, I made it very clear uh, that I was accepting fully the Libertarian Party platform as my own. And I believe if uh, somebody is campaigning to uh, represent or, or shill for a political party as we are, um, then absolutely we must represent that party uh, to, our, to the fullest of our extent. And that, and how does one define, how does one know what a political party is about? It is in fact, uh, by reading the platform. And so I've been spending uh, large uh, portions of my campaign spreading the word of the uh, Libertarian Party directly uh, to the people and encouraging people to uh, read the Libertarian Party platform for themselves and, uh, and see for themselves exactly uh, how much we have uh, in agreement. And uh, for those things that sometimes seem uh, counterintuitive to, uh, to normies, if you will. Um, I, I encourage them to uh, seek out uh, knowledgeable uh, libertarian individuals that can help explain our uh, our reasoning and what why what might not initially make sense to them uh, can absolutely make sense uh, once it's explained. Um, we find this time and time again. Uh, just today, uh, me and my VP Spike were on a call with uh, 50 plus uh, NYU students. And it was, of course, uh, entertaining because the kids want to have a little bit of entertainment, but yet we were also uh, bringing in uh, all our various analysis in response to their questions, uh, consistent and based on the uh, Libertarian Party platform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supreme. Uh, our next uh, answer will be from Mr. Hornberger. Mr. Hornberger? Yeah, remind me what the rule is. How long is the answer? Two minutes, sir. Okay, thank Unless you. Unless you want to extend. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, this one's a, just a softball for me. I mean, I've always held that most the most important thing that a candidate can do in this party is hew to principle. We are the party of principle. How often do we think about what that means? You know, I think it's imperative that every so often we do a lot of soul searching and we say, you know, what does it mean to be the party of principle? I think it means that you have a certain set of principles and you hew to them, you adhere to them, that we're not the party of expediency. We're not the party of vote getting. We're not the party of, of reform. We are the party of principle. And that means we adhere to our principles. When I was on the platform committee back in the 90s, there were already people back there saying, Jacob, we got to abolish the platform. We've got to hide our principles because they're causing us votes. People are finding out where we stand. And I took the position, are you kidding me? Our platform is our foundation. This is what protects us from the reform oriented candidates that are out there telling people what libertarianism is when it isn't libertarianism. That way we can hold up our platform and say, here is real libertarianism. And this is the way we achieve a free society. If we libertarians are not going to advocate liberty because we're afraid of what the reaction of others are gonna be, if we're gonna deny our essence, to deny who we are, and we're gonna to try to become Republican or Republican lights or Democrat or Democrat lights in order to please the people, then where are we? What are we doing in this movement? What are we doing in this party? Ever since this party was, was formed in, 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 in David Nolan's living room, the, the quest has been to achieve liberty. And we do that with our principles uh, that, you know, you, you go to people and you say, this is what we stand for. They might reject it, so be it. But at least we be, remain true to ourselves. We are libertarians and we need to fight as libertarians. Thank you, Mr. Um, Judge Gray. Well, sure, and thank you, Chris. I, I see no conflict here. Uh, we are staying on message. We keep with our principles. We don't compromise our principles. I do see a difference, however. I, I support people like Jeff Hewitt, who is a supervisor in Riverside County, libertarian. Jim Turley, who's a commissioner in Florida. You know, these people are bringing our liberty message, and it's moving the needle toward more liberty. That's what we do. We, we move it so that we can accomplish more tomorrow than we did yesterday. An example, if you're going to say, okay, I'm going to stand on these principles. I'm going to abolish all public education. What are you going to do? You're going to scare people. They won't listen to us any further. But if you go a little more slowly and say, look, how about charter school? Do you see that charter school over there? Do you see this, this school choice over here in Milwaukee or in Indiana? We can show, hey, wait a minute. I like that. I like Jeff Hewitt. I like school choice. Then let's, I want more of that. So we, Larry Sharp and I, will help the down-ballot candidates, not scare people, but show them the truth, that the party of principle really does work. And me that message is, we'll be better tomorrow for you than it was today. And we can have a better hand on the budget deficit, all these things that I'm sure we're going to talk about this evening, but I want them to be better tomorrow than they are today. So that's a principle, and that is our action. All right. Thank you, Judge Gray. Um, our next question, we're going to move into a current event uh, topic. And um, here's the question. There's been, a, if you looked in today's uh, news, there's a lot of accusations recently between Trump and Biden about the White House's coronavirus response, that we responded too late, that we did not take enough action, that the president should have exercised the Defense Production Act sooner to take over private business. If you were asked by a national media outlet to comment what would you say about the White House's coronavirus response to date? And what would you have done differently in handling this situation to keep Americans safe? Um, this question first to Joe. I would tell the reporter that we've just had an assault on our liberty that we haven't seen in our lifetime. That is what we've gotten from the current administration. Right now, we've got politicians who are both spending money and keeping us at home. So we're getting uh, attacked on two fronts of liberty. And on the money side, I'd like to point out that bureaucrats are incompetent at knowing where the money needs to go. Only a free market can do that. As president, I would stop the bailouts 
and also get repayments back wherever possible from the companies who've already gotten the money. Also, what they're doing right now with these bailouts is they're doing the same thing that they did in 2008 when they bailed out the financial industry. And what we had was a long recovery session that took us years to get over. We had young people who had a hard time getting jobs. The, the economy was stagnant. My number one issue is to cut spending, and that's even more important now. We really need to go on the offensive to drive down spending before we have a catastrophe. So we need to ramp that up even more. Government spending kills jobs. Private money spent creates about twice as many jobs as the government. This is how we get uh, financial stability, and this is how we stabilize the dollar. We can't keep printing money. As far as staying home, what I would have done differently is I would have done something with the FDA so that we get testing kits out there faster. A lot of people don't realize we had about 60 different companies creating testing kits that the FDA did not approve. They only approved about two. So that means that our testing kits made right here in America were available for the rest of the world and they took advantage of it and yet we couldn't take, take advantage of it. Our president was sitting there saying the only way you need to, or the only reason you need to get tested is if you have symptoms. But that's completely wrong because about 60 to 80% didn't have symptoms. We needed to have testing so that we could go on with our, uh, on with our natural lives. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, Mr. Supreme. Yes, uh, uh, naturally, I would uh, make a very strong point of uh, the government having uh, absolutely screwed the uh, pooch, if you will, and uh, hammering home the, the very clear and obvious message that the uh, government is uh, unable or unwilling to be prepared or to respond to such a, an event in a timely fashion. Um, and of course, I would uh, certainly see the uh, seeds of doubt as to uh, their efficiency. I would certainly uh, compare that and contrast to it with, uh, you know, everything Joe said, uh, the, the regulations that prevented uh, the testing kits to come out and uh, and ultimately the vaccine and, and various things like that. The regulations that uh, slowed up the response, I could certainly point out that uh, uh, we lost a lot of time in denial and diddling and all that. And then, of course, for sheer entertainment, I would throw out that if I was president, I would outlaw COVID-19, number one, and anybody in position of, of uh, COVID-19 would be in violation. I would create COVID-19 free zones. And if that doesn't take care of it, I don't know what will. Going back in time, I will kill baby COVID and I will build a microscopic moat around this great nation of ours, antiviral, antimicrobial, and follow that up with a moat full of hand sanitizer. So thank you very much. That's what I bring to the table. I'm Vermin Supreme. Thank you, Mr. Supreme. Um, Mr. Hornberger those moats around my house. Uh, you know, we've got three dysfunctional systems that are creating a perfect storm here that have been produced by Democrats and Republicans. Our country started out with an economic system where people keep everything they earn, no income tax and no IRS. Uh, there was a free market healthcare system. It was the best healthcare system in history, one where people didn't even need healthcare insurance because prices were so low and stable. And then we had a, a sound monetary system. All of those were rejected by Democrats and Republicans. So we have the system based on massive income taxation that Republicans favor in the IRS and some even reform-minded libertarians favor. And then we have a dysfunctional centrally planned healthcare system. I, I published a book for, with my foundation in 1994 called The Dangers of Socialized Medicine, where we've been saying, all these years that the only solution is to separate healthcare in the state, a true, genuine free market healthcare system, instead of one that tries to reform this central planning socialist system we have with things like health savings accounts, and then a free market monetary system, a separation of money in the state. So that's what I want to take to the American people. Look what Trump has done as a central planner. They, it's, it's chaos. It's what Ludwig von Mises called planned chaos. And they have shortages of this and shortages of that. And then when the system starts cracking down, you get the tyranny. You get the lockdowns, the curfews, the arrests, the prosecutions. You've got the dictatorial nature coming out in mayors and, and, and governors all across this land. What I want to do is lay the foundation for a different world, a new world for America, one that ba is based on our heritage of freedom and free markets. Get rid of the income tax and the IRS. Get rid of all this central planning and socialism and healthcare. Get rid of the Federal Reserve and the Fed 
And then now you're talking about the foundations of a prosperous society, a healthy society where people have savings to get through a rainy day. Thank you, Mr. Hamburger. Uh, Judge Gray. Well, thank you. As I said just a few minutes ago, this is a perfect example of how libertarian principles and actions work and how government is part of the problem. No, government created so many of these problems. Look, in the first place, they failed to plan. And if you don't have a plan in place for an emergency, who knows, an earthquake, a hurricane, a pandemic, it's too late. They failed us flatly on that. And then you know what we saw and are still seeing? Politicians are behaving politically to in effect protect themselves, not us. So you have mayors and governors wholeheartedly saying, oh, poor little people, I'm going to do everything I can to keep you healthy. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to close down hundreds of thousands of businesses unnecessarily. I'm going to deprive, what, tens of millions of people of their jobs unnecessarily, but I'm going to keep you safe. So if you stay healthy, I'm a hero. Wow, it was successful. Or if you get sick, well, you can't blame me. I did everything I could. Nonsense, because it wasn't a part of the balance to consider these other issues as well. Libertarians would. We certainly do. I went to a bank recently, or it could have been a hardware store or a clothing store. No, the answer is allow the, the people in the stores, the managers, to advertise. Look, we know this is serious. We know you don't want to get sick. We don't want our employees to get sick either. So we're going to require people to wear gloves before they come in. They're going to require the spacing, which is good. We're going to protect people. But then you get to choose. You make the decision as an adult. If I own it, clothing shop, I'm probably also going to have someone outside with a thermometer, which now you can actually take people's temperature without even touching them, and so not allow anyone with the temperature to come in. I mean, these are things that libertarians do. These are things that people are going to be crying out for. These are really important. So what do you see? The government paying $2.2 trillion of money, which they don't have, the, the Secretary of the Treasury had a slush fund of $500 billion, some to his friends, some to other cronies. No, the answer is no. Libertarian principle and approaches work. Thank you, Judge Gray. Um, I, I see Mr. Mons has just joined us online. I'm going to give him a chance to um, answer the first question and then to answer the most recent one. Uh, Mr. Mons, just real quick. Can you tell us about yourself and why you decided to run for the presidential nomination and what are the objectives of your campaign? All right. Uh, I apologize for the technical uh, difficulties, but uh, a little bit of my background. Uh, I am a descendant of uh, formerly enslaved uh, great great grandparents, uh, Columbus Morning Ferguson in Georgia. And um, I was born in Detroit, I finished high school in Florida, uh, got my college degree from Morehouse College and with a concentration in banking and finance and a little bit of, of my background with the party. I found the party in 2004. I've run for office four times. And in, in those four races, I've accumulated over 1.8 million votes uh, for the party. Uh, you know, the, the campaign, the campaign uh, with me, the message is, is central. I think that we have to have a strong libertarian message and we have to concentrate on issues where we can hit the other parties and win and and, and hopefully uh, get support from the average American voter. Thank you, Mr. Mons. Our last question, I'm going to have you answer that too. Um, it was, there's been a great deal of accusations recently between Trump and Biden about the White House's coronavirus response. We responded too late, that we did not take enough action, that the president should have exercised the Defense Production Act sooner to take over private business. If you were asked by a national media outlet to comment, what would you say about the White House's coronavirus response and what would you have done differently to keep Americans safe? Well, uh, you know, first of all, uh, the, the response, you know, I think the, the results uh, that we're living through right now will prove that it, it was a horrible response. And, you know, as a libertarian, I think the best way to handle issues, you know, is to use the marketplace, free markets and empower individuals to make their own decisions. And part of those decisions is how much risk they want to take in, in life. And, you know, what what would I have done differently? Of course, we have a, a little benefit of hindsight, but I think the move to shut down the economy, it was totally uh, incorrect. You know, we're going to have the fallout from this. Uh, we, don't, we don't know how long it's going to last with the fact that with food production, 
uh, being disrupted, uh, income disrupted. We may have more people affected uh, through the actions of our government or, and connecting around the world that will harm more people than this virus uh, <laughs> could have ever done. So, you know, I, I, I look at it as this, you know, right now in getting back and opening up businesses, that's what should have uh, happened in the first place. Business should, businesses should have been allowed uh, to remain open and develop their own strategies for handling, you know, how they interact with customers uh, and, and things like that. We don't need to have an attitude that uh, is presumptuous that most people are, are, are too ignorant, you know, to be able to make their own choices and decisions. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to now put all of you on the spot um, and ask a, uh, a question that was a little divisive today. Today, the uh, Libertarian National Committee took action to postpone the May convention to what looks like an early July in-person convention, but you know that's not certain yet. That debate and the vote leading up to it was divisive. Some argued that an online convention violated the National Committee's bylaws. Others argued that we needed to hold an online convention in May to give the presidential nominee more time to run. Um, others argued that holding an in-person convention in early July would result in most preferred media for the nominee and a springboard for their campaign, and we could accommodate health concerns uh, for the delegates with those concerns by allowing them to participate online. What do you think as a presidential candidate? Should they have postponed the in-person uh, convention to July or held it online in May, and why do you say that? And also, is that decision that they did today, is that good or bad for your campaign if you're the nominee? Um, we'll go ahead and we'll start with uh, Mr. Supreme. I think we would all prefer an, a live in-person convention, obviously, and I think in a perfect world uh, on, in the uh, scheduling that we had chosen originally would certainly be ideal. However, since there is so much uh, uncertainty uh, involving uh, that in terms of venue and, uh, and health risks and like that, I uh, fully understand and uh, accept the, uh, the move. I, I, I didn't uh, get a full briefing on the the actual vote and, and the debate and uh, how acrimonious that was. Um, and once again, I've always uh, maintained that ultimately the decision uh, should be made up to the delegates to uh, choose uh, the nominee. And uh, of, of course, I'm also a, a firm believer in uh, the bylaws and exactly what the uh, bylaws spell out uh, as uh, permissible and uh, not permissible. And uh, so I am cautiously optimistic and um, I, I think uh, of course I think a, a live campaign would uh, a live convention would be uh, more more better for my campaign because um, that gives me the opportunity to make that sale thank you sir uh, mr. Hornberger yeah my expertise is libertarianism and I've always admired people that serve in the state um, LP hierarchies and the national IP uh, LP hierarchies it's just never been my cup of tea to do that, to be a, like a regional rep and stuff. And I, I, I highly admire people that learn Robert's Rules of Orders and they, they specialize in it and they go through the bylaws and all that stuff. That's not for me. But so I put my faith in the judgment of the LNC. These are the people that know what they're doing on on with respect to the administration of this party. Now, I, I would say I agree with Vermin. I think that however way this thing works, I want to put my faith in the delegates. Whatever the delegates um, nominate, whoever they nominate, that's fine with me. But as far as how this thing runs, that's up to the LNC. I will say this, that, you know, delaying it to July really doesn't bother me. I mean, this has been a transformative event in my life. I, I am having the time of my life. I've been to 18 state conventions. I've been to small conventions, Mississippi, Vermont. I've been to big conventions, California, Florida. I, I mean, up to the shutdown, I was having the time of my life. Uh, let's see, I think this is my 13th presidential debate. So to extend it out of two more months, man, it keeps me going. It keeps my batteries charged. I just wish we could do it in person. I wish this, this thing had never happened, this, this corona crisis. But I think there's also an advantage that for the latecomers into this race, they're not going to be able to participate in these debates. I think they might have thought that, hey, with the convention three weeks from now, they would escape the debates. Two months now, there's no excuse for anybody escaping these debates. So I think that's a great, be great benefit for everybody in the party. Thank you, sir. Um, Judge Gray. Well, sure. 
Chris, I think I speak for all libertarians, which we want to have an in-person debate. It's your in-person convention. This is an unconventional time, if I can use that word, but we all think it's exciting to be together, the free flow of ideas and, and uh, debates, discussions, all of that is good. Uh, and I, I would think that this would be helpful for us all to get our message out, to have it in person. We'll get more attention, more people there with provisions for those that are unable to attend in person. And we have to have that as well. But otherwise, you know, I certainly abide by the decisions made. Uh, like Jacob, I'm not an administrator in that regard, and I respect what they're talking about. But I think the in-person debate was better than in-person convention. It's a trade-off. Welcome to real life. I mean, that, that's what happens in life. You have some trade-offs. I understand that if we delay it for, for, for a couple of months until July, that there may be uh, ballot access issues that we might lose on, which is a concern. That's certainly a concern. So it's a trade-off. But on balance, I think in person for all would be best making those provisions for those that for whatever reason are unable to attend. Judge Gray, uh, Mr. Mons. Well, in, in my experience uh, with the party for over uh, 15 years, um, you know, being or de dealing with the LNC has, has not been something that, uh, you know, I've done in the past. Um, and I actually trust those who that is their, uh, their wheelhouse and, and that's what they want to do. Um, that's where their involvement with the party is. And they, they've been put in leadership positions. And I, I know, you know, some people are going to be very unhappy about uh, the decision, but uh, we're, we're in times, uh, unprecedented times, and um, it, it's no telling what's going to happen between now and July, between now and November, um, with all the disruptions going on in, in in the country. So, you know, I'll lean with, uh, you know, trust in their judgment. And, you know, as far as campaigning, I'm going to, you know, keep man maintaining and doing what I can to get my message out, you know, to the delegates um, and, and to members of the party. So, um, you know, we'll see, you know, exactly, you know, how it plays out. But, you know, I, I agree with, with the other uh, candidates and, and I, I want to be in front uh, you know, of the delegates and, and make my case. And I think doing that in person, you know, is a, is great. You know, I'm not afraid of other candidates having more time, you know, to, to get their message out. You know, I'll respect anybody who, who runs for office. And uh, I think it's, it'd be better in the long run, uh, you know, to have a process, you know, that everybody can participate in and, 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 you know, everybody has an equal shot. Mons, Joe. Well, of course, we couldn't keep our May convention with some of the delegates in their lockdown states. We libertarians believe in fairness. So we had to make a change because we need everybody to have their voice. You know, our party members and delegates have the right to have their voices heard. Unlike the Democrats and Republicans who make their decisions from the top down with their party elites making decisions for the entire party, we believe that our party members should have a voice. So changing the convention to an in-person event did that. Uh, I, party members should never be disenfranchised. As far as whether it's good or bad for my campaign, to me, that's irrelevant. What matters is what's best for the party. We need to grow the party and we need to do that by sticking to our principles. That's why I completely agree and will completely support the platform. Plank by plank, sentence by sentence, right down the line. I'd also like to admit uh, or, or mention uh, one other advantage of having an in-person uh, convention. So we're here giving our views and how we would run a campaign. But I think it's a good idea for us to listen to the delegates. So while I have, you know, there, there are some things I will not change. For instance, I will not go against any party plank, any part of the platform. I will not do that. However, there are different ways to present the platform. So the convention gives me the opportunity to speak with delegates and to get their feedback and to hear, you know, what's good, what's bad, and how maybe we can improve because we need to grow the party. We need to get as many votes as possible, and we need to get more members into the party. And we do that with feedback and from listening to the delegates. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to a couple of general questions at this point. Um, and uh, the first question is for um, everyone, of course. 
Assuming that you are not successful in your campaign for president, do you commit to supporting the eventual nominee of the LP, no matter who the delegates select? And would you be interested in running for vice president if you were not successful in your presidential run? And why or why not to each? Um, I will begin uh, this with uh, Mr. Hornberger. Uh, it would depend on the candidate that, you know, when whenever I decide um, about who to vote for, I always vote for a libertarian. I mean, that's a no brainer for me. But, you know, and, and I'll ador endorse everybody on the stage today. There's no question about that. Whether I get excited and get uh, participate in a particular campaign, uh, that depends on the nature of the campaign. If it's a Republican ass type campaign with with uh, reform oriented proposals, that does nothing for me. I mean, I, I've just been like this since the 90s. And I, I joined the party because I read the, the party platform and I was just so stunned. Here was this pure libertarian manifesto. And a guy named Bill Evers had asked me to serve on the platform committee. And I said, no, Bill, because I didn't know what the party platform said. And I said, this is just a political party. It's just going to be doing a bunch of reform stuff, trying to pacify voters, trying to expand votes with ad hoc positions. And he says, have you ever read the party platform? And I said, no, I don't need to. I know what it says. And he says, let me send it to you. And I read this thing and it was just a pure libertarian manifesto. And that's why I joined the party. And I, I called him. I said, it'd be an honor to serve on the platform committee. And I served three terms. And ever since, you know, I've seen two kind of campaigns. The one's based on principle. And, and that kind of campaign I will get behind. If I'm not the nominee, if the, if the nominee is somebody here talking principles and platform and, and things like that, I will get wholeheartedly behind that kind of campaign. If it's a reform-oriented campaign that tries to reform the welfare warfare state, I'll, I'll vote for the person, but I won't get involved in the campaign. I'll just go back and advance the principal case for liberty at my foundation. I think really principles are everything. That's how we're going to achieve the free society. That's why I keep saying this is not just a political race here. This is a battle for the heart and soul of the party. What do party members want? Do they want to advocate the reform of the welfare war first day or they, do they want to advocate liberty? And you know my answer. Mr. Um, does that. Uh, Judge Gray. Well, certainly the answer straightforwardly is yes. Uh, I will support the Libertarian nominee. I will campaign for the Libertarian nominee. Uh, I will also continue with Mary Sharp from New York to campaign for the down ballot candidates as well. That's really where the, the road and the rubber come together as well. So I just don't see a conflict there particularly. Uh, the answer is Libertarians bring the right message, bring the right principles, bring the right approaches. And, and that's what the governor, government should go into, reduced magnificently reduced government intrusion cost expense messing just not 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 it was interfering so much so i will i will support the libertarian certainly thank you judge gray uh mr mons well i think well the the, the first part uh, of the question is this you know i i plan on continuing you know running for the uh, nomination for president and putting everything in it all the way to convention and and see what happens uh, you know i have no interest in in running for the vice presidential slot i think that was the second part of the question um but i, I do plan on supporting the nominee if it wasn't me um and continue to work for the party uh you know i've been you know committed to the party uh since uh 2004 and you know i'm not going anywhere uh you know i've enjoyed you know what I've been able to accomplish and also, you know, meeting some of the, the, the greatest uh, people that I've ever met in my lifetime. So uh, we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, being a, a VP candidate, I, I haven't, uh, you know, written it off, you know, but it really depends on, on what's best for the party. Um, and, you know, the, the circumstances with, um, you know, how the convention goes as far as I see it. But, uh, you know, I'm committed to the party and doing whatever I can, you know, help the party grow and also to move the needle of freedom. So that that's important to me. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Joe. 
So, of course, I'm going to support the presidential nominee, whoever that is, because regardless of who we nominate, it's going to be, you know, he or she is going to be much better than Trump or Biden or anybody that the Democrats and Republicans would put up. The Democrats and Republicans are headed that way towards larger government that we'll never recover from. Libertarians want to head that way. So, of course, I would support any presidential candidate. And let me point out, I have voted for the Libertarian presidential candidate every single election since 1980 when I voted for Ed Clark. In fact, uh, in 1988, uh, my husband had to do training out of state. And so it was shortly before the election. I actually went through the trouble. Let me just mention, I hate paperwork. <laughs> I hate paperwork with a passion. And yet I made, I went through the trouble to to re-register to vote in the new state. Uh, this was in Kentucky, by the way. I went through the trouble to register as a Kentucky resident, just so I could vote for Ron Paul in 1988. And then when we moved back to South Carolina, I changed my registration back. So absolutely, I will support and uh, help whoever the candidate is. As far as the VP nominee, if I didn't think that I weren't the best presidential nominee, I would not be running. I would have a difficult time uh, being the VP candidate for somebody who I really didn't agree with 100%. And whoever I support really needs to show that the party comes first. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Mr. Supreme. Um, as I have stated in the past, uh, I will certainly affirm uh, that if if I'm not the, on the off chance that I'm not the nominee, I will certainly make myself available uh, to the nominee at, at various uh, events as a draw and or uh, opening act. And that I will continue to uh, advance my recruitment efforts on behalf of the Libertarian Party and continue spreading the word of liberty. Uh, as for the VP slot, I, I believe talk about last minute entries. I, I believe that would uh, probably be a little uh, unfair to the uh, uh, current uh, very qualified field of uh, VP candidates. Uh, so I, I don't think I'd want to uh, jump into that. Uh, as for, I would like to touch back to the last question briefly in that if we do move the, the convention to July, which it, it seems like that's, that is what it is, um, it is unfortunate that we uh, do uh, lose a month of active actual uh, campaigning in the general. Uh, and on, it would be most unfortunate if we were not able to make deadlines that would not allow us to uh, get access in several states for the presidential uh, general election. And but however, if that is the case, uh, we need to recalculate and reassess um, our our goals, our strategic goals for what we hope to accomplish with uh, the, the general election. So I, I'm just going to throw that out. Thank you. Great. All right. Um my next question is um, another general question to all of you. Uh, what is your plan to obtain earned media for your campaign to spread the message of liberty if you're the nominee? And what steps to date have you taken to execute that plan? Um, I'm going to start with Judge Gray. Well, sure. It's certainly, as we were saying, an unconventional world, and uh, we're going to use unconventional media. We already have a team in social media. We're getting followers, of course. My vice presidential running mate, Larry Sharp, has 60,000 followers already. And by the way, ever since 1992, when I held that press conference, I've been involved in major media ever since. They know me. I was on the O'Reilly Factor twice. Uh, I can't say he agreed with me, but he invited me back. Uh, ABC News specials, things of that kind. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of local as well as national shows. So, so we've got the media. No, I don't Twitter, but I'm going to learn, I guess. Uh, that is ways that we can meet people. Uh, most people don't watch the, the standard media, the traditional media anymore. We've got good, solid people now in all 50 states that are working toward outreach, working toward delegates. And by the way, anytime you travel somewhere, and I'll maybe talk about this soon, but we have a plan to win this election. It will go to five small states. We know we're not going to capture Florida or California or Texas, but find five independent small states. And then we'll look at those voters at their grocery stores, at their town hall meetings, if they can have them, at the uh, Kiwanis meetings. Your vote will matter. Your vote will make history. If we win two or three small states, imagine that probably Biden's and Trump will not get enough electoral college votes to win the majority in the electoral college. No Democrat is going to vote for Trump, I promise you. No Republican is going to vote for Biden, but they're restricted to the top three candidates. We could win this election. And if you go to those two, three five small states, 
the media will follow. Wherever I went as the VP candidate in 2012, I got good local coverage, and that will continue to happen. We win just one state. Talk about liberty message. That will make a libertarian revolution in our country. That's what we're going to be doing. The New York Times contacts us or ABC News. Certainly, we'll, we'll talk with them, but we're going to devote our attention to those five small states. And we're going to win at least one of them and probably more. It's going to be exciting. That's great. Mr. Mons. Well, I have a little bit different strategy as far as uh, uh, getting media. Uh, first of all, in, in my concentration on uh, becoming a nominee is to, first of all, commit to going to every state and work through the state leadership uh, in each state to to uh, do and set up events that are important to them. And that's that's where the um, the rubber meets the road is, you know, making commitments and going out to states. And then you can earn what I believe is even better than just getting national media is, is getting local media that, that helps our down ballot candidates um, it generates excitement, you know, across the country. And, you know, my nomination, I see it as a, a historic event. I think that's something that uh, national media would not be able to ignore the campaign. And I, I think that would save the party a lot of money because, you know, I, I've never uh, rejected you know, an interview opportunity, uh, a debate or anything. And, and I maintain that that type of attitude I've already done in my previous campaigns, uh, you know, live TV. I've been interviewed. Uh, mostly my campaigns have been in Georgia. So, you know, major uh, news channels and, and on TV or radio. And it's something I'm used to, something I've done. Uh, so, you know, my focus is definitely going to be on working from state to state, generating a lot of local media with a campaign that the national media could not ignore. And I'll let them come to us. And I, I think the, the party would win, uh, you know, a, a lot of new faces and hopefully new members, you know, with the exposure that I, I would give them. Mr. Mons. Um, next, uh, Joe Jorgensen. So of course we've got social media. I think pretty much everybody does. Uh, something that I've done recently is I've been available pretty much around the clock, which is why I think I was featured more prominently in a recent uh, Reason article. Uh, I actually gave the interview after 11 o'clock at night. Also, I was uh, reached by a Fox News reporter yesterday. And again, I returned the call very quickly. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to point out, I don't believe in identity politics. I'm not running on it. Anybody who's gone to my website, anybody who has seen my previous debates knows that I don't say, hey, I'm a woman, therefore I deserve it, because I am a libertarian. I believe that people should be um, hired for the job based on their skills and their abilities, not uh, for discriminatory reasons for, for identity politics. But I would like to point out that I think I would get media because right now I keep hearing complaints about we've got two old rich white men running and I would be the most different out of all the candidates and I think I would get attention for that. And again, I'm not running on women's issues or pointing out that I'm a woman, but of course the media is going to see that. And so many people are upset with the libertarian or I'm sorry, with the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is for, um, it's supposed to be inclusive and it's supposed to be for women and gays and everybody. And yet they've got another rich old white guy. Also, I'd like to point out that I will have a message that people care about. A lot of libertarians run on what they care about. I'm going to run on what excites the American voter. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about is the environment. And very few libertarian candidates have done that because it typically doesn't excite us. However, it excites um, the voters. So I'm going to talk about what they want to hear about and they are going to be asking for more of the message because I'm selling what they're buying. So, um, Mr. Oh, I guess my time was extended. Oh, this is the first time I've ever heard that I'm rich. It's nice to, it's nice to know. Uh, I don't think my wife would believe you. But I also wanted to say, and I, I didn't answer this before, I'm not, I'm not going to be a vice presidential candidate. I think Larry Sharp is a superb libertarian, a superb vice presidential candidate. No one will do any better than that. So 
I would encourage him to run with whomever the nominee is, but candidly, I think it will be Gray Sharp and we're gonna do you proud. That's my extension, I'll give you back some time. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Supreme. Um, yes, I've spent uh, 30 years uh, cultivating uh, media relations, uh, even long before I made it past the editors of the media source, I realized that the uh, media workers uh, were a very important audience to get to know and meet. And that has certainly paid off uh, throughout the years. Um, I meet many of the same reporters uh, time and time again. Uh, if, you, if Generally, if you type my name in with about any media outlet, you, you will find uh, coverage uh, uh, at some point. Um, uh, so uh, there is that, um, the, the fact that essentially that is a major part of my campaign is media manipulation. And uh, certainly over the years, that proves it out. My willingness and ability to uh, do the occasional stunt. And uh, if I were the nominee, I would certainly uh, be uh, guaranteed to you that I would take that uh, stunt arrest at the uh, uh, debates and all of those things. And so, and my uh, social media presence is massive and uh, my audience is wide. And um, I believe that uh, once I was the nominee, I would it would be irresistible. The sizzle would be irresistible. And I pivot to our serious messaging. Thank you, Mr. Supreme. Uh, Mr. Hornberger. Yeah, I think the cardinal sin of any political campaign is to run a boring campaign. I remember one ca one candidate for statewide office for the LP. I won't mention any names, but the newspaper said he accused him of running a Republican light campaign. And it, it was just highly insulting because it was just a boring campaign. We wouldn't target states. We Our plan is if we're accorded the honor of this nomination is to target demographics, uh, target groups of people. We don't think Biden has the black vote locked up or the Hispanic vote. When I was campaigning heavily in North Carolina, I campaigned heavily among the black community. And I went in and meet, met newspaper editors there in, in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. I got a, a newspaper article from a black reporter there who's an ardent leftist that said, I want everybody to know that I'm considering voting for Jacob Hornberger. And he explained all my campaign. And then he said, um, I exhort other people to consider doing this as well. I walked into a Hispanic newspaper there that, that publishes all across the state. And I, and I, I know I shocked the woman, you know, I said, um, and, you know, I told her in Spanish, favorezco libre de comercio, libre de migración, fronteras abiertas. And she was so stunned, you know, open borders, free trade and open immigration. She says, come into my conference room. She called her publisher over in 10 minutes. I gave her the case for open borders. They said, come back. We want to do an hour long interview with you. This is an example, and they did, they published a whole interview on all aspects of, of libertarianism, that the interview was in Spanish. This is an example of how boldness can generate your, your own publicity. I mean, there's nothing I love more than to get attacked for being a libertarian. I've been attacked by saying, Jacob, you're too radical. Well, what they're really doing is condemning libertarianism because all I stand for is libertarianism. And that's what generates your publicity, standing purely on principle, even if people are attacking you, because I love it, because I can defend this philosophy and I can defend it well. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, we are going to move to the next um, individual targeted questions. Um, and the first question um, will be for Mr. Mons. Uh, Mr. Mons, on your website, you indicate that you will cut government spending. What programs from the federal government do you support retaining? Uh, and why? Did you say uh, what programs are worth yeah, retaining? What are, and why? what are you gonna keep and why? That's a good question because I, I believe about 90% of the federal government needs to be eliminated. So, um, you know, we still need some form of national defense. So uh, that is something that, that should be man, maintained. And you know, every other agency or, or program needs to to one, uh, see if it's in, in line with the constitution. If it's not, it needs to be eliminated. Um, and that's kind of, you know, how I uh, would approach the, uh, the, the situation. And I just want to make a quick comment um, that came out of, out of the last question was that, uh, you know, I'm not running an identity campaign, you know, in, in all the campaigns I've run, you know, I do not mention race, but it's something I don't run away from. And, you know, it's just a fact that, you know, those outside of the party uh, for various reasons or interests, whether it's media 
or, or, or whomever or organizations, you know, would just, uh, you know, look at our candidate, you know, depending on what they bring to the race. And, you know, for example, you know, if Joe was the nominee, you know, her being a woman was would be something that, that could not be avoided. Um, so that's kind of how I, you know, you know, why I brought that up as far as, you know, if I were the nominee, that it would certainly bring attention, you know, to the party. Uh, and I think in a, in a positive way. Um, Thank you, sir. Um, our next question will go to Ms. Jorgensen. Um, Dr. Jorgensen, uh, Joe, um, what lessons can we learn from your run with Harry Brown in 1996? So I think the biggest lesson to be learned is that you can run as a true libertarian and support the platform plank by plank by plank. One thing I liked about uh, Harry Brown, and this is what I'm trying to do, is he supported the libertarian platform and he did not compromise on a single issue. And yet he explained it in a way that people would understand and see the benefit of libertarianism. And I've mentioned this before. When I first joined the Libertarian Party, I was going around, I, I just thought liberty and freedom, this is great. Of course, people will see how, how um, this benefits them. Of course, they can see how this is the best system. And when I went around and I talked about how we get to keep our own money and we don't have to throw money after Social Security and all this stuff, the response I got was not what I expected. People were saying, well, you're just selfish or you just don't care about poor people. And the my favorite, and this is one I heard most often, we well, you know what, Joe, not everybody's as smart as you are, so we have to have social security for people who aren't smart enough to save on their own. So that's when I realized I was approaching it the wrong way. And it wasn't until I became a salesperson for IBM that I realized you have to sell the benefits, not the features. And that's exactly what Harry Brown did. And and it worked. That's why we increased the party by 8,500 members, because we showed people what liberty and freedom could do for them. And we explained it in terms of what they saw, how it would change their lives. Whether again, it was being able to replace the old furnace so they could go to bed at night and not worrying about waking up in the middle of the night cold or getting a new car, being able to afford education. And people really responded to that. And I think they'll respond now to that message. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Mr. Supreme, the next question is for you. Uh, there is a portion of the Libertarian Party that has argued that rent is theft, but the national platform in section 2.1 provides that as respect for property for property rights is fundamental to maintaining a free and prosperous society. It follows that the freedom to contract to obtain, retain, profit from, manage, or dispose of one's property must also be upheld. Do you believe that rent is theft or do landlords have property rights that should be upheld? Uh, to believe in uh, rent is theft, I guess one would have to uh, very much uh, look at the uh, the arguments being made. Um, I, I know they uh, there are arguments that are made uh, to that effect. Uh, of course, I fully uh, support the Libertarian Party platform, and I do believe that uh, rent is rent. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question will go to Jacob Hornberger. Um, Mr. Hornberger, uh, are there any parts of the national platform that you disagree or quibble with? And if so, which ones and why? Well, the abortion plank, I'm a very devout Catholic and I'm pro-life because I believe that life begins at conception. I also disagree with some of the transition uh, programs. They, they, they have a very principled approach in certain programs, uh, like you know, getting rid of the uh, drug laws and so forth. But others, they want to transition, which to me involves the initiation of force during the period of the transition. I don't see how that's ever reconcilable with libertarian principles. And, and freedom doesn't worry me. I mean, if, if libertarians are, express a fear of freedom, how do we ever expect our, our fellow Americans to feel any differently? We've got to have confidence that you can get rid of these programs immediately and that freedom works. You can count on a free people. We got to we got to recapture this faith in ourselves, a faith in others, a faith in freedom, a faith in free markets. And and I think we that's where libertarian leadership comes in is instilling that faith and getting other people to have that faith. 
I want to follow up on what Joe said about the Harry Brown campaign. I mean, as everybody knows, I got into a political battle with Harry. It was an unfortunate battle. But I will say this, and anybody's ever asked me, I don't think anybody's run a more principled campaign than Harry Brown. And you can go back to the 96 campaign that really would, where Joe was, and it really shows you how the party has kind of moved, and I think in a, in a not so positive direction, that Brown came out with the idea of abolishing the income tax and replacing it with a consumption tax. And there was com complete blowback and pushback on this from the party members. And Brown was, to his credit, said, okay, you're right. I should never have done that. Abolish the, the income tax and replace it with nothing. Because a free society necessarily depends on abolishing the income tax, not reforming it. No flat tax, none of this IRS stuff. And Brown understood that. And that wise to me, when it comes to advancing liberty in this party, he was heroic. Thank you, Mr. Marburger. Um, our last, uh, or not our last, our next um, individual question goes to Judge Gray. Um, Judge Gray, one of the recent criticisms leveled at your campaign was your support of universal basic income. Given that Section 2.4 of the national platform calls for the repeal of taxes and income taxes and for the voluntary funding of basic services, how do you square your position on UBI with the national platform? And furthermore, do you believe that taxation is theft? Okay, first of all, Chris, I don't know where that came from. I do not support UBI. I do not. My basis is based on Milton Friedman, so I'm really solid ground. He had something he believed in the negative income tax. It's going to take me a couple of minutes to explain it, but I adopt to this. So, for example, the first $30,000 of income, no one would spend any, pay any income taxes on that at all. You, me, Bill Gates, nobody. So what if you don't make any money? And here, I would give them a stipend. I, as long as they're 18 years of age or older, here legally as a citizen or a green card, I would give them a stipend of, say, for illustration purposes, $15,000 a year, broken into $1,250 monthly payments. But all importantly, and what's so drastically missing today, is that for every dollar they would earn between zero and $30,000, they would lose 50 cents of their stipend. That is missing today, and it's, it's bringing terrible results. So you have incentives to improve yourself, incentives to earn the extra dollar. What about the homeless, for example? And I'll say very directly, and I expect people will agree with me, if I were bleeding on the street right here, you would have no legal obligation to help me whatsoever unless you caused my injuries. That would be different. But we will because we want to, because we're compassionate people. And so with that, for example, the homelessness or single mothers could have a stipend. People that just get out of prison could have a head start and do away with all other welfare programs, all of these alphabet soup agencies we have that are counterproductive, fraudulent, bureaucratic, intrusive, all of them would be gone. I would go for a flat tax, graduated, and that would get rid of IRS's intrusion enormously into our lives. Everybody would win except maybe H&R Block and the bureaucrats, and I can live with that. Is it perfect? No, but it will show people because, Chris, when I was in the Peace Corps, one lesson I learned, even in Peace Corps training, I was in Costa Rica, abo espanol como la gente también, but I learned that you can't change people's approaches unless you I'll ask one more extension, please. Okay. Unless you change the idea that it comes from within. And so if you show things that come from within, then they will change. And if you show them, for example, we haven't talked about education, but if you show them how their child would be better educated in school choice, then, hey, that's a good idea. You show them also that you can better yourself because you lose only 50 cents of this stipend, you have an incentive to earn the extra money, that's where we make progress. And then we can go for the purism, which is great, which I support in our in our uh, platform or anywhere else, but it's a, gra it's a more gradual step. We'll be better off tomorrow than we are today, which I say really is good. Getting rid of the IRS intrusions into our life, boy, that's devoutly to be wished, as Shakespeare would say, and that's where I would stand. Judge Gray. Um, my next, let me look here. Uh, uh, all right, um, we're into the, the second question. Um, jo, this one is to Joe Jorgensen. Joe, are there any parts of the national platform that you disagree or quibble with? And if so, which ones and why? Not a single one. That's the end of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that was short. Um, Berman, I've got another one uh, for you. Um, yes. 
One of the uh, criticism that's been leveled at you and your campaign is that it's a joke, it's not serious, it's going to be ignored by media outlets as being unserious or even worse. Um, that your involvement in the past with groups like the Church of Youth in Asia will cost the party both ballot access in several states and cause brand damage if you're the nominee. How do you respond to those criticisms? Well, once again, I believe I have uh, addressed uh, uh, how a serious party can uh, adopt a joke candidate for the uh, top office. Uh, and I believe that it is absolutely 100% in owning the joke, admitting that, yes, we are, in fact, putting up a joke because the electoral system, the duopoly, the presidential election cycle has indeed risen to that level of a joke uh, where there is enough context uh, to push that narrative forward. The hashtag in on the joke absolutely 100% uh, inoculates uh, the party. You know, every time they say you're a joke, no, it's, it's our joke. We're making the joke. No, you're the joke. And here's why. Um, of course, the, the, uh, the gimmick, if you will, the, the uh, character that I have developed, uh, the uh, imaginary uh, platform planks that, that I present with the ponies and what have you, uh, those are serious satire. Um, it's a serious joke. It always has been, and I've used it to uh, pull the curtain back on, uh, on duopoly nonsense. Uh, so I totally 100% believe that the party can easily uh, weather any sort of storms or negativity uh, that's uh, as a result, and my campaign staff, and once again, uh, people working on my campaign, the level of support that I get from principled libertarians leads me to understand uh, that what we are proposing is a legitimate path forward for the Libertarian Party. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, my next question is for um, Jacob Hornberger. Um, Jacob, uh, you alluded to it earlier, um, and I'm going to bring it up. Uh, there was the spat with Harry Brown uh, in in your last run for presidency, and my understanding is, and you can tell me if, if correct this in your answer, um, was that uh, as a result of that, when you lost the nomination, that you uh, went out and left the Libertarian Party, ran as an independent. Um, do you believe that that was an appropriate reaction with the benefit of hindsight? And um, you know, there's I've heard it from a couple sources, some concern that. If you're not successful in this nomination, we may see a similar response from you. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I think it's important to put things in context. I believe that ethics are of the utmost importance. I said this 20 years ago, I think, and I say it today, that the Libertarian Party has to be a leader in the form of ethics, not just libertarian principles, especially when you consider the massive ethical violations they were, that are taking place with Trump and, and the Democrats. And there were massive, serious, grave ethical violations that were taking place. And that's why several of us, um, a lot of people in the Pennsylvania Libertarian Party, that we took on the whole party, not the whole party hierarchy, but part of the party hierarchy. Imagine if you learned today or any of these candidates learned that the executive director was helping me out on a secret basis. Everybody would be outraged. And this is what was going on. I mean, there's, there's an article online uh, by R.W. Bradford in Liberty Magazine called Fraud in the Libertarian Party. And he details what was going on and it was bad stuff. And I took a stand against it. I paid a big price. I took on the party hierarchy. I took on the Brown campaign, paid a big price. When it came time to running for Senate in Virginia two years later, I asked for help from the party hierarchy. And they said they wouldn't lift a finger for me because they were still mad at me because I had uh, taken the stand in favor of ethics. So I went out and got 15,000 signatures on my own. They wouldn't help me one bit to get one signature. I got some friends and I hired a professional. We got on the ballot. And then at that point, I wanted to run as an LP candidate, but it was clear that the party hierarchy was going to do nothing to help me. And I was concerned that they would sabotage my campaign. And I wanted to run a good campaign. I, but I, I could have gone over their heads, but I figured, well, if the party hierarchy is going to sabotage me, what's the point? I want to run a good campaign. And at that point, I said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and run as an independent. And at that point, I said, you know, there's so much negative energy that I said, I, I'm just going to uh, devote myself to advancing liberty in the um, ideological uh, arena, the educational arena. And I'll take uh, one minute of my time here. Uh, and that's the Future of Freedom Foundation. So there's different ways to advance liberty. I've de devoted my life to advancing liberty, and I love it. I mean, I've been the luckiest guy in the world to be able to do as an avocation, a profession, advocating liberty. So it really doesn't matter whether you're advocating liberty 
full time in the party or in the educational arena. And then two years ago, I said, you know, it's time for me to come back. Uh, that that uh, there's a lot of positive energy in the party. I started growing. And I said, you know what? I'm going to jump back into this race and I'm going to offer people an opportunity to, to, to go for this hardcore purist principle mm -hmm. method, wage a campaign of principle for the party of principle. And that's what I'm doing is, is giving sim simply people an option. This is the way to go. And I guarantee you, if I make this race, I will make ethics a top priority against these Democrats and Republicans because that's what this country needs. And I think that's, that's what this country wants. Thank you, Jacob. Um, our next question. Oh, Joe, you, you've got a rebuttal. Yeah, we, we get three one minute rebuttals, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I noticed. Well, I'd like to take one of them. I noticed that somebody who's watching asked, uh, said to ask me about the sex work plank. So I would like to point out that I was a delegate to the 2018 convention. I voted for the sex work plank. And you can ask the person who was sitting next to me, and you can also ask my state chair, and they will verify that, yes, I voted for the sex work plank. Somehow an ugly rumor got started because at a convention where there wasn't a microphone, I couldn't hear the question clearly. And I, um, in, I, yeah, I didn't understand the question. And so my answer made it appear as though I didn't. But again, I vote, uh, I voted for the platform right down the line. Thanks, Joe. All right, I believe our next one was Judge Gray. Uh, this question is for you. Um, if I can get it up, there it is. Um, in your Reason Magazine, uh, there's a Reason Magazine interview that you did when you announced, and it indicated that you are, quote, an incrementalist and a pragmatist. And my question to you, is um, do you support the complete abolition of any of the following federal agencies? And if so, which ones and why? The Department of Education, the IRS, the DEA, the Federal Reserve, the EPA, and the FDA? Okay, well, yes, I am an incrementalist. I think I've made that clear that we will get our principles in, in effect a lot more quickly if we don't scare people along the way. So if you say, I'm gonna abolish the military or the, the Department of Defense uh, or Pentagon, that's going to cause problems. Yes. What I would do is, though, first, I, mean, I, I would abolish the Bureau of Indian Affairs in a heartbeat, the Department of Education as well. But that it, just because I want to doesn't mean it's going to happen. So we would put in our sunset provisions, Chris. And it's really important that we shine a light, an audit on the federal government and allow each of these agencies to come to Congress openly, individually, and show what they've done for the last three or four or five years, how much they've spent, what they've promised, what they have been able to accomplish. Again, implementing Milton Friedman's mantra of you get more, you can, uh, uh, what is it, you can uh, uh, judge programs by the results, not their good intentions. We would focus a light on those. I'm convinced that the Department of Education, the Department of Commerce probably couldn't mask that or be cut way back and then eliminated thereafter. There's no provision in the federal government right now to eliminate agencies. So we would have to create that one and I would be very influential in doing that. Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Indian Native Americans call it bossing Indians around. Uh, listen to uh, Henry Ford, by the way, not my favorite person socially, he was probably anti-Semitic, but he said something and I stress this on the stump all the time. Anyone that feels they can thrive by relying on the government should talk to the American Indian. It's that sort of thing that gets this message across. So yes, I would abolish federal agencies, numbers of those that I just said, and we'd focus a light on all of the rest of them. It would be successful. That's what I want. Thank you, sir. Um, our last question is to Mr. Mons, uh, at least our last individual question. Um, Mr. Mons, you've run for office a couple times, but um, have not been successful yet. What do you believe you've learned from those prior runs for office? And do you believe that this run will be successful if you're the nominee? And how do you measure that success? That's a great question. You know, what, what have I learned in, uh, from my previous um, runs is, is this message is still the key. I, I believe if you go back uh, to some of the video of when I ran for governor in 2010, um, the message has been consistent and and I think that's important and that's the way I've always uh, run my races um, you know when you talk about measures of success there's, there's a lot of different measures of success 
And, and I think that uh, my nomination would cover all of them. For some states, it, success is looked at 2% of the uh, vote or 5% of the vote. Um, success, uh, like in, in an example I give when I ran for governor in 2010, is forcing uh, the dialogue to a different position. And you know, if I did not uh, win the presidency, at least putting my opponents in a position that if they won, that they would have something uh, that they would maybe adopt, uh, you know, from the rhetoric that I gave them. So, um, you know, being consistent, stay on message about freedom. That is the, uh, the most important thing that any uh, candidate can do. Force the issues uh, on the other parties because, you know, another example I give is the, the Socialist Party. Socialist Party in America doesn't win races, but what they have been uh, able to do is shift public opinion. And by doing that and getting public support for the things that they, they, uh, they want, the other parties have adopted this socialist ideology and implemented it. So that's what we have to do as libertarians. We have to force the issue and change the paradigm of thinking with the American voter. Because if the American voters are with us in what we believe, and that's freedom, then the other parties will adopt our positions and implement them just to stay in office. And, and I, th I think that'd be effective. Thank you, sir. Um, we're gonna move to candidate to candidate questions here in about ooh, just a couple seconds. Um, for, the, for our viewers this evening, though, uh, there's going to be a link that uh, is going to be scrolling across the bottom uh, to poll tonight's debate performance and your preferred candidate. Um, that The uh, debate and the voting uh, for this will be open for 30 minutes following the conclusion of the debate. It's open now. You can begin voting now. Um, and you can go ahead and tell us uh, who you um, uh, think did the best job, who, who you'd like to see in future debates. Uh, and that would be helpful for us uh, for, for future invitations. Of course, no candidate is uh, required to do that. It just will invite them and it depends on their schedule. But uh, uh, we would appreciate folks giving some feedback to the candidates. I think they'd appreciate the feedback. Um, and by the way, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't do this. Uh, but uh, special thanks to uh, Christy Kendrick and Scott Philback with the Libertarian Party of Kentucky for helping to put this event together. Um, they always do a great job. So. Um, we'll go ahead and begin candidate to candidate questions. Uh, Mr. Supreme, uh, the first question is yours. Question no, for uh, Judge Gray. And uh, of course, uh, you know, I, I'm really uh, important. Uh, a very important thing uh, to me is uh, reaching out to, to the youth vote and and, uh, and reaching out to the kids. And uh, of course, uh, pop culture references are very important to these kids. And so I, I would like to ask you, sir, uh, who do you believe is more important to bring to the forefront uh, for for uh, pop culture reference purposes, Judge Dredd or Judge Judy? Thank you. Boy, that's a tough one, I tell you. Uh, I, I can tell you, and I heard overheard two surfers talking recently, Vermin, and uh, one of them said, hey, dude, you know, I just found out that there's no popcorn in popcorn shrimp, so why should I eat pot roast? Well, that's something that, you know, we, can, we can address. Okay, I, there's hope for me. But, you know, we need to reach out to the young people. They are na our natural constituents, Vermin. You know this. I, I, I talked about my grandson being $67,000 in debt when he was taking his first breath. We're the only ones that speak for the youth. We're the only ones that speak for the elderly and the sick because we would bring competition back into the healthcare system, reduce prices, increase quality control. Talked about education as well particularly the downtrodden, the ones in the lower economic areas are natural constituents. They are the ones whose children are being failed by public schools. I wrote an editorial recently, couldn't get it published in the LA Times for somewhat obvious reasons, but it was an open letter to the ACLU, to the NAACP and MALDEF, criticizing them for not taking the lead on school choice because it's their constituents that are being harmed. And so a, a, a more wealthy people can afford to choose elsewhere. In fact, the, the deal is, hey, parents, choose choice. So these are things that we naturally do. We have the constituents. You reach some. We all reach some. But we've got to reach more, not by scaring them, but by showing them the possibilities. Then they, too, will come to the libertarian cause because it will benefit them. And that's our message. And I think you're, you agree and you're with it. Good for you. Did you like my joke? 
Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Spring. Thanks, Doug Gray. Uh, the next question will be for Mr. Hornberger. Mr. Hornberger? Uh, this question is for Vermin Supreme. Uh, Vermin, your, your background and your entry in this race really intrigues me because you've spent a lot of time with the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And now you've come into this party and you, you, you look at our platform and you, you're very conscientious. If you don't know an answer to a question, you read the platform and you say, well, that's what I agree with. I find yes, it very intriguing how you have embraced libertarianism and the Libertarian Party. Would you share some of the insights that you learned from about Democrats and, and Republicans that caused you to, to reject them and come permanently into the Libertarian Party? Well, ultimately, sir, it, it should be understood that um, when I ran as a Republican, I was not a Republican. And when I ran as a Democrat, I was not a Democrat. I was not involved in their political parties in the least. Uh, and mainly, I was uh, simply uh, utilizing them as a flag of convenience in the New Hampshire primary, primarily uh, as a means to launch forward uh, my critique and, and garner the media. Uh, so I come from a, a, an anarchist perspective. I've always been an anarchist. And I've been using uh, my satire to uh, to taunt the, the system, if you will. Now, my relationship uh, into libertarian would take a little bit of time to get into. Uh, but uh, let me say that uh, some of the important parts uh, came out of the New Hampshire primary, uh, meeting Ron Paul in 2008 and, and some of his supporters, 2012, overlapping and working with the uh, Free State Project in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, of course, uh, Boomer Shannon uh, invited sort of invited me in. Trent Soms of the Youth Caucus uh, brought me to the International Students for Liberty Conf uh, Conference uh, a few years back, and that is where I felt so much love and support from the Libertarians and Libertarian uh, Party affiliated people that I felt uh, that I really needed to check that out, and that led me to the uh, Orlando Convention, where uh, the people. Uh, welcomed me. I was. Uh, they allowed me to play with the conventions of conventions, have fun with various points, with the understanding that, that I had lines that, that I would not cross to, to muck with things. Uh, but I was doing things that uh, things would have got me thrown out of any other convention, and they were loving it. And ultimately, when I came to the platform, I started reading the platform and understood that it. Uh, it ultimately it dovetailed very nicely with. Uh, almost all of my beliefs that, that I have as, a, as an anarchist. And uh, that and the fact that the Libertarian Party itself is a party that, comp uh, that is uh, comprised of anarchists and minarchists, I felt that it was the only party that would indeed welcome me as an anarchist and welcome uh, my talents and my input and my involvement. And uh, so it, it did take me a long time. Uh, that you'll find quotes where I, I would just, like dismissive of the Libertarians, uh, but it was prejudice on my part. I overcame that prejudice through education, and, uh, and now I'm trying to share that with other people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supreme. Um, the next question will be from Judge Gray. Judge Gray? Yes, I'd like to ask John Mons a question. Um, John, you were very successful in your race for public service commissioner in, in Georgia. You got lots of votes, uh, and I heard several comments from you already uh, I, I assume that you agree with my proposal to change the culture, to get more libertarian message out there, to make it more acceptable and accessible. Is this what you used in those successful campaigns too? Well, the message has is, is always been one that's uh, adhered uh, to the Libertarian uh, Party platform. In 2008, uh, when I ran for public service uh, commission, I talked about ending monopolies. Uh, in the uh, regulation of, of the energy markets. Back when I ran uh, in 2006 for a local uh, school board seat, you know, I talked about, um, you know, making homeschooling and other options for parents and giving them more choices. So it, it doesn't really matter what, what the race is. You know, the fact is if we stick as candidates to the libertarian platform, to the libertarian and freedom uh, message, I think that's where the success comes from. And also, also from the dynamics you know, of the race, um, you know, whether you're running against two opponents versus one, you know, uh, that plays a part in how successful you are. And you know, each one of my races have been different. Um, once again, going back to just the local race that I had uh, for school board. 
in that particular race, you know, running on it on a uh, an educational reform type platform, uh, I received 13 uh, percent of the vote in that race. And that was the highest percentage uh, voting percentage of any candidate for Georgia back in uh, in 2006. So, you know, stick to message, be consistent and, and, and let the voters just make up their own their mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonds. Mr. Bonds, actually, the next question is yours. Uh, let me see. I, I think I'd like to address uh, Jacob. Okay. Your question? And my question uh, for you, Jacob, is if you had an opportunity to move to a small rural uh, community in the state in which you reside, so you wouldn't have to leave your state, and joining with other libertarians in that community, you were able you would be able to elect, you know, uh, you know, all libertarian candidates. It's uh, something like a free state project on a local level. Would that be something that you would be interested in? Well, that's a fascinating question. Um, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I, I love where I live here in Virginia and uh, I, I, I really like it. I, I I live outside DC. I, I'm out more, you know, toward the mountains in that direction. I live about uh, 45 minutes out of DC. I don't like going into DC too much, but I think the the idea of just moving to an area just because there are libertarians that are in charge. Um, no, I mean, I, I figure I, I, I have no interest in moving to New Hampshire. I understand that that's the, the free state project. I figure that you know, even nationwide, I want to, I want to take my stand where I am. I want to fight for liberty nationwide across this country. And I've, I've often heard, you know, libertarians, well, maybe we can go offshore and establish a, a seasteading project and we could go buy an island where there's nothing but libertarians. I kind of like living in a society of diversity where there's not libertarians. I mean, you know, a lot of the people I encounter in life, a doctor, my doctor and other people, they're not libertarians. And I enjoy interacting with them on other bases. Um, I, I, I think a, a world where there's just different views and different things is great as long as they're libertarian principles that are being uh, adhered to. So, yeah, I, I wish everybody well that would go and join that kind of society. But as for me, I think it's better just to keep fighting for a free society nationwide so that we don't have to go into these communities to live only among libertarians, that we, where we can live in a free society overall. Our last question will be from Joe Jorgensen. Joe? So this question is for Jim Gray. I fully support our party's platform, which says, and I quote, we call for the repeal of the income tax, the abolishment of the Internal Revenue Service, and all federal programs and services not required under the U.S. Constitution, close quote. Your negative income tax program requires an income tax and would either keep the IRS or a very similar agency. So I just want to know how you reconcile your program with the platform. Well, Article 1, Section 8, Joe, and a legitimate question. We have government. We have a federal government. It needs money. So how is it going to get it? I don't like trade barriers. I don't like tariffs. So that's a problem. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the value added tax and things like that. So yes, uh, you, as you know, fighter airplanes are expensive. So are fighter pilots to train and, and to keep. So, so yes, this is, but the IRS probably could be done with on a postcard almost. They would be really heavily phased out. Joe, think of all the intrusion then from the government that we would no longer have to deal with if the IRS were cut back so strong. Think of what the, the welfare state being so far cut back, uh, we, would, we would help stave off this bureaucracy, all of these alphabet soup types of agencies. So yes, is it half a loaf? Well, I think it's probably about four fifths of a loaf. And then we can show the rest of our constituents in the country, in this new libertarian culture, how that was so much better. Let's keep going and pursue those principles. That's what I am doing. Thank you, Judge. Um, at this stage of the game, we will be moving to closing statements. What I will do is, I, if you've not used an extension card, I will just add that on to your um, closing statement. And so normally the closing statements are two minutes. It could be up to five minutes if you've not burned any cards. I've kept track. It looks like Joe's used one. Judge Gray's used two. Uh, Mr. Hornberger's used one. 
Um, and so uh, if you've not used them, you'll have the time. I do want to remind everyone that's watching, there is a poll that's going on right now at lpky.org-debate. Um, and we will begin with uh, a closing argument from Mr. Hornberger. Mr. Hornberger? Yeah, we're living in some very dark times. There's no doubt about that. And these dark times, even before the coronavirus crisis, we're living in dark times. We've got massive suicide rates among young people. I mean, what's that all about, you know? Uh, we, we've got uh, suicide rates among veterans. We have unexplained killings. I mean, there's got a lot of bad stuff going on here, a lot of darkness. But there's one light that's shining through this darkness, and that's us libertarians. It's in the political arena. It's this party. We are lighting that darkness, and we've got to make clear that this light never goes out. If we become like Republicans and Democrats, that light is extinguished. Right now, we have hope. And hope for America, hope for freedom. And that hope is, lies right here in this party and in this movement. Now, I want you all to understand that if I were accorded the honor of this nomination, I will adhere strictly to libertarian principles. You have no doubt about that. You could go sleep at, well at night and wake up in the morning not thinking, oh, Jacob, I can't believe he just told people that libertarians believe that. I want you to know that I will never stand for any welfare, government welfare, stipend, stimulus checks, whatever word you want to use for the massive stealing, because that's what it is. It's stealing. It's political stealing through the, uh, through the income tax or any other method that takes money by force from one person and gives it to another person. Freedom necessarily entails keeping everything you earn and deciding what to do with it. And also, there is no care and compassion into this kind of system. The notion that the Internal Revenue Service somehow or another vests us with care and compassion is pure nonsense. This is a brutal agency. It's a tyrannical agency. Why do you think our ancestors rejected this system? There was no income taxation or IRS or mandatory enforced charity for more than 100 years because they understood that freedom is inconsistent with that. We can rely on the voluntary charity of our fellow Americans. We don't need this kind of force to help the poor and the needy. I grew up in the poorest city in the United States. My, my, the doctors in Laredo were serving, this was before Medicare and Medicaid. The doctor's offices were filled with poor people, including many from Nuevo Laredo, which is right across the river. They knew that most of them or many of them could never pay their bill. And there was never a case where any doctor turned away any patient for inability to pay. This is what I want to recapture in this country, not this coercive, mandatory, brutal, IRS system that kills people. Don't forget, talk to Peter Schiff and ask him what they did to his father. They killed his father. His father died in prison because of tax resistance, because he dared to question this brutal, evil system. In 1954, a, a great individualist writer named Frank Shodoroff wrote a book. I highly recommend you can read it online for free. It's entitled The Income Tax, Root of All Evil. And what Shodoroff says at the end of that book, he says, look, you know, we've got to fight. This is the time for leadership, libertarian leadership. This is 1954. This country's moving towards socialism, thanks to both Democrats and Republicans. We may not win, he said, but we've got to set the standard for, for younger people of what fighting for liberty is all about. Even if we lose, there's virtue in that battle. That's what I'm saying. This is what I, why I want to wage a campaign of principle for the party of principle. I want to tell the American people what we're about, to be honest and genuine and say, this is what we're fighting for. This is what our lives are about. This is why we're in the par this party. This is why we donate money to, to this cause. And it is a cause. It's not a political thing. For us, it's a cause. I want to talk to them and make the positive case for liberty. This is what we would, would happen if we have a free market economic system, a free market healthcare system, a free market monetary system, a free market immigration system. Bring all the troops home. Stop killing all these people. Uh, is that for me? That is, yes, sir. That's four <laughs> minutes. I thought I had five minutes. You had four. You used one extension. Okay. Then, yep. then I'll just wrap it up by saying, let's do something bold. Let's wage a campaign of principle for the party of principle. Thank you, Mr. Hornberger. Uh, Judge Gray, uh, your closing argument, uh, you've got three minutes. <laughs> closing argument, I'm not gonna argue with anyone. That's what I was talking to judge, but you know, I'm a, I'm a judge. By the way, did you know that the word listen and the word silence have the same letters in them? 
I was trained to listen, trained to assess, trained to weigh the evidence and then make a decision and explain it. And I live in the real world. And I understand that, that we, we would like things to be different. And I'm moving toward having things being different. So if you're going to have a military, you're not going to be able to fund the military by charitable contributions. If you have a court system, wait a minute, be careful what you ask for, because if you're going to have private people, private foundations actually paying for the courts, they're going to buy a lot more justice than people don't do that. No, we need some money for the government. Much, much, much less. Under my program, we will have much, much, much less. All of this with regard to a line item veto for a president, for the sunset provisions, show the people how, in fact, their world will be better by adopting libertarian principles. Show them with regard to school choice, with health care. We, we had a great health care system, like numbers of us said today, before Medicare started improving. Now look at it. Ask yourself this question we did before. Have you ever seen the federal government enter into the marketplace in which they didn't have prices increase phenomenally and quality go down? We've seen that in education, healthcare, so many other things with this pandemic, get in the way, et cetera. This is what we do. So we have that plan to win, to win at least one small state, to make this revolution, this change in culture happen. That's what will foment this change. My Peace Corps training taught me that, and we're going to follow it through. So graysharp2020.com. Join us, share us, donate to us, and I promise you once again, if you support us, or even if you don't, Larry Sharp, Judge Jim Gray, we will do you proud. It's time. The government, the country needs, needs desperately what we will provide. Does polarization? No. Merit? Yes. Responsibility, transparency, more private enterprise addressing problems. Because the private enterprise system actually addresses and solves, tries to solve problems. Government politicizes them. We've seen this drastically. The country needs us. We're going to be there for them. Whether we meet in a convention, whether we meet virtually, Gray Sharp is going to be just fine. Thank you very much. And we will do you proud. Thank you. Thanks, Judge Gray. Uh, Mr. Mons, uh, the next closing statement is yours, and you have five minutes, sir. All righty. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Kentucky for uh, you know hosting this event. And I just like to say this, I look at my campaign as this, what, what should the party expect from me? And, you know, I say it's the total package. You know, first of all, you have a, a libertarian candidate who has been successful in every campaign he's ever been in, involved in. And I think that should matter. I mentioned earlier, I have 1.8 million votes that were cast for the libertarian party in, in my four previous uh, races. You know, uh, also, you know, I'm very committed to the party. Uh, you know, when I wasn't running for office, th those uh, four other races, you know, I was active in the LP Georgia uh, executive committee, um, you know, helping develop the state, you know, with membership and, and, and setting up um, affiliates. And right now I'm currently a party to a federal lawsuit here in Georgia dealing with ballot, ballot access uh, for U.S. House uh, candidates. Uh, experience. You have a candidate that has done televised debates, live debates, been on TV, uh, radio, national programs, um, and also a candidate that you can trust. You don't have to worry about John Mons, you know, going somewhere. I'm committed to the party and next year I'll be with the party. You know, as long as I'm still living, I'll be working hard for freedom and liberty. You know, how, how can we be successful? And the message is clear. Uh, we have to concentrate on issues where we are in the right, for example, with the drug war, that we've been right on that for 40 years, and press the other parties. When we talk about bringing the, truck, uh, the troops home, the drones home, and that's because we expose the life of what, what it is, has been the history of, of foreign policy in the country. When we talk about ending the income tax, you know, that's an argument that we went on. I haven't run into anybody, you know, that was against getting rid of the IRS and the federal income tax. You know, when we uh, talk about issues, uh, reforms in education or um, uh, this uh, Second Amendment, you know, Second Amendment is very, uh, you know, has a strong uh, group of supporters. And we have to point out to where uh, the Republican Party, who's looked at as being strong on the Second Amendment, has, has been very weak. And that's what we need to do. That's what I promise to do. I, I 
you know, am committed to going to every state uh, that will have me to campaign uh, not only for the, the national office of president, but also for uh, the down party uh, candidates. Um, you know, we have a great opportunity and, you know, I hope that you'll go to mons2020.com, learn a little bit more about my story, um, you know, reach out, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here, you know, giving my all, you know, for something I deeply, deeply believe in. And that's, you know, making this country better, not only for uh, myself personally and my family, but for yours also. And that's the message we take to the American public. And, you know, I'd appreciate your support. And uh, I want to you know, give a shout out to folks in Kentucky. I enjoy my, my visit there and uh, look forward to coming back. Thank you. Thank you, Mons. Um, George Organson, four minutes. Thank you. As president of the United States, I will use my authority as commander in chief to bring our troops home. America will become one giant Switzerland, armed and neutral. This will save trillions of dollars and spare thousands of lives and casualties. We will stop fighting undeclared foreign wars and leave wealthy allies to fund their own defense. We'll be at peace with the world. I will use my pardon power to free people convicted of exposing government corruption and for crimes where there is no victim. The land of the free will no longer leave the world in incarceration. Anybody who's convicted of a nonviolent drug offense, nonviolent sex work, anybody who just simply owns a gun, anybody in a federal prison, I will pardon on the first day. This will end our devastating war on drugs, send nonviolent prisoners home to their families and make our streets safe. Fathers will be able to support their families and be able to be role models instead of sitting in prison for something that wasn't a crime to begin with. Also, women will be free to choose to do what they want with their bodies. It is their body, they have the choice. This will open up the prisons for real crimes so we can lock up muggers and rapists and people who commit real crimes that hurt people. I will work to reverse the obscene multi-trillion dollar bailouts eagerly rushed into law by Democrats and Republicans. And I will veto every bill that raises taxes or that adds even a dollar to the nation's debt. This will stabilize the dollar so your earnings and savings can go by more. Seniors will be more financially secure. We'll stop saddling our children and grandchildren with trillions in debt. Private investors, rather than special interest-driven politicians, will decide where to invest wisely, which will create millions of productive private sector jobs. I will insist that Congress set priorities, balance the budget, and put an end to deficit spending. My veto pen will get a real workout. I will work with Congress to truly create a competitive free market in healthcare, so you can get the healthcare you need when you need it. Healthcare will be so effective, so safe, so innovative, and so low cost that most people won't even need insurance. You can get the care you need without going broke. Your healthcare choices should be entirely between you and your doctor, or better yet, not even a doctor. If you choose to go to alternative care, that should be your choice. We need to get rid of these licensing laws that just uh, keep the doctors in a medical monopoly and squash competition. I'm running on a bold, principled, libertarian solution that appeals to the millions of fed up independent voters. That's who we need to go after. I'm a lifelong libertarian, deeply committed to our principles and platform, and I'm eager to turn Americans on to the fabulous benefits of liberty as your nominee for president. Please visit joj2020.com and join my team. Thank you very much, Kentucky, for having me. Thank you, Joe. Um, our last uh, closing statement, Berman Supreme, uh, and you've got five minutes, sir. Maybe. 
Uh, uh, <coughs> Justin Amash uh, would like to invite you to uh, please go to uh, lp.org slash platform. Uh, if you have any questions, just to my bona fides as a uh, activist, uh, anti-authoritarian activist in opposition to the state for uh, for some 30 years, please check out the uh, documentary, Who is Vermin Supreme? Uh, that is available on uh, Vimeo. Um, I would like to say that uh, it is indeed a pleasure participating in the debates. Uh, kudos to all of uh, my worthy opponents for uh, joining uh, uh, us in various combinations uh, over all this time. And uh, I would just like to point out that, yes, I have a legitimate offer that I believe that I am presenting on the table, and I thank you for your consideration. Uh, the important thing uh, to understand, of course, is that kids are naturally anti-authoritarian. Kids are naturally nonconformist, and they want to know why things are the way they are. And kids also want to change the world. And uh, myself, as the voice of a new generation, uh, have been... Uh, trying to do just that, to, to spread the word of, of mutual aid and voluntarism and charity and liberty and love and empathy uh, to, uh, to my younger audience. Uh, and I believe it is the only thing that is currently getting us through uh, this current crisis is, is people checking in on people and making sure that their people are, are doing okay. So it's, it's not the feds knocking on your door, calling you up to check in on, you know, it's simply not. It's people helping people, it's neighbors helping neighbors, um, it's building stronger families and stronger communities, and that uh, always negates uh, the need for government. And uh, in closing, I would like to uh, read this prepared uh, statement. Our entire society has been disrupted. Let us not, let it, let us not let it go back to the way it was. Let us not let ourselves go back to the way we were. Let us heal. Let us work together. Let us look to the future. Let us make a better world now together. We don't have to go back to the old world. Disruption leads to innovation and change. Innovate now. Change now. Disrupt now, let us no longer carry the things that do not serve us while we have this unprecedented moment in time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supreme. Um, just a couple things uh, in wrapping up. If um, our viewers can take some screenshots and our candidates can smile, uh, we're going to try and share this out on social media um, and uh, say thanks for coming uh, to all of our candidates. Anybody that's watching, the debate poll is going to remain open for 30 minutes, lpkyorg uh, slash debate. And uh, thank you, especially the candidates, for spending their uh, Saturday night evening with us. I'm sure you all had other things to do. Um, I know a couple of you reaccommodated schedules. We do really appreciate it. For our viewers, uh, we've got a couple other things coming up. We've got an open um, forum night for basically everybody that's filed with the FEC tomorrow. It's going to be a short intro. So we some polling from that. We've got another debate coming up with some other folks. Wednesday night. And finally, next Saturday night, May 9th, we're going to have a debate. Same time, 8 to 10. We've not determined for sure who's going to be on that, but we have invited and he has accepted uh, Congressman Justin Amash. So he will be on next Saturday night um, with a, another debate lineup. We look forward to that. I think that might be his first LP, uh, LP debate, and we look forward to hosting that. Uh, so with that, uh, have a great night. Uh, and Liberty viewers, don't forget to vote. Thank you all. Have a great night.